Hey, well, online, good to see you. My name's Aiden. I haven't seen you in a couple minutes. Uh, if you're new to checking us out online, we're glad uh, that you're here. I know many of you may be, may be checking us out for the first time. Many of you may uh, attend Norton, the actual physical campus, but you're kind of tuning in online wherever you're at. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, we'd love to connect with you on our website. There's a little red dot at the bottom right of every page of the website. It says next steps. You can click on that and that kind of has maybe information, next steps, uh, but also ways to communicate with us. We would love uh, to hear from you. Um, a couple years, a couple years ago, probably 15, 17 years ago, uh, me and some friends, late high school, early college, were in a in a pop band. We like pop music. We were kind of, you know, trying to trying to find some opportunities to grow in our pop band. And there was a guy who would he kind of was a promoter. He'd put on shows and different things in Akron, and everyone kind of knew who he was. He's a quirky fella. Um, but one time, a friend of ours was kind of going to meet us up with this guy. We were going to get to try and make a good impression on him so we could get some opportunities with him. And so we met him at the Canton Dollar Theater, where you, in 2008, could go see a movie for a dollar, like it was 1953. But we went and we met him there, and, and he kind of came late. And afterwards, we're standing outside, kind of underneath the entryway to the movie theater. And we're sitting there talking, and I'm... I don't know, a junior in high school, something like that. And this guy's like a pretty quiet guy. And uh, if you know me at all, I can't do awkward silence, so I will just fill it. All right, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, but I'll just, I'll just say things. A lot more when I was younger, if you can believe it. And so we're standing out there, a couple of guys in the band, and this promoter that we're trying to get to be on his good side. And on the one of the, like, the marquee posters is something about the Beatles. I'm a young guy, I want to be in a pop band, I randomly say to this music promoter, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the Beatles. To which he replied for about 20 minutes why the Beatles are the most important thing on the planet and essentially saying it without saying it that I was dumb for not liking the Beatles, right? Here I am wanting to get some clout with this guy being in a pop band and I tell him I don't like the Beatles, right? <clears throat> and what I gathered from this conversation and it stuck with me is if you're gonna be a fan of something, whether it be a movie or an artist or whatever it is, you gotta be a fan of the best work, right? Like you don't have to, I, I, full disclosure, I'm not a huge Beatles fan, but I appreciate the work, right? You, you can't be a fan of something and not know the best work, right? You can't be a fan of U2 and not know the Joshua Tree. It's what I listened to this morning getting ready to preach. You can't be a fan of Pink Floyd and not like Dark Side of the Moon. You can't, you can't know Beethoven and not know the Fifth Symphony. You know it. Ba -da, 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 da 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 That's the Fifth Symphony, right? You can't be a fan of Taylor Swift and not like 1989. It's her best album, right? It's her best album. You can't love Star Wars and, and, and not appreciate Return of the Jedi, right? I think that's agreed upon the best of the films. Possibly Empire Strikes Back. You, you can't like McDonald's but not appreciate the Big Mac, right? If you're a fan of an artist, you, you gotta appreciate its best work, right? Now, as we jump in today, I wanna frame a couple things. We, we believe that Jesus of Nazareth was God, that he, he wasn't less than God, he wasn't uh, produced by God, that he was God, became a human being, born of a woman, walked this earth. We believe that Jesus is Savior. We believe that he lived a perfect life, was crucified on a cross for our sins so that all the sin that we ever commit, past, present, future, could be dealt with, right? Because hate and wrongdoing and offense, it doesn't just disappear, somebody absorbs it. And we believe that Jesus was the savior who absorbed our sin. We believe that Jesus is Lord, that he's Emmanuel, God with us, that he was the prophesied and promised king from all the scriptures, that he's the Messiah, Alpha and Omega, the ultimate hope for everybody in this world. But we don't always think about this, and we also believe this, that 2,000 years ago, as Jesus walked this earth in towns and villages and cities in the Middle East, that he was an amazing teacher. That he was an amazing teacher. Look at this. In Matthew 7, Jesus gives this, this big sermon we're going to look at. He said, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority. Crowds would just hear Jesus teach and they're like, we haven't heard someone teach like this. He was an amazing teacher. I love this. Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem on one of their big holidays and he's ruffling some feathers. And so the religious leaders send kind of the, the temple police to go, they're like, arrest this guy. 
And when, and when the temple guards came back, when they came back with, without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? There's like, where's Jesus? Why isn't he in cuffs? They said, we've never heard anybody speak like this before. The guards responded like, they're like, this guy's the, we've never heard anybody talk this amazing, right? He was the best kind of teacher. Crowds were either amazed, some people were offended, some dedicated their whole lives to him, some plotted to kill him. That's when you know that you've got some good art going on, right? It's polarizing. As Jesus taught, he told stories. He referenced the, pe the Jewish people's history. At times, he was abundantly clear. And at other times, he was so abstract that even his closest friends were like, dude, we have no idea what you're talking about, right? That Jesus often would use striking metaphors and some pretty compelling object lessons, such as exorcisms from time to time. But you know why people followed him? Why people were drawn to him? It's easy for us to look back and be like, well, it's because he was God, right? And if God was teaching, you would listen. That's not why. People were, people were split. People thought he was, they didn't know. People were drawn to him. People followed him because he was compelling. And he offered people a compelling way of life. This message of Jesus, it was perplexing, it was powerful, and it has shaped some of the most core assumptions of our Western culture and values that we may not even be aware of. It's, it's worth thinking about. Do you think forgiveness, like the, 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 the truth of forgiveness, our need for forgiveness, do you, do you think that that is just like inherent? Like we just naturally, like so naturally we should forgive each other. That just comes from nowhere, right? You think that the Romans who shaped history for, for hundreds of years, you think that they, they were like, we should care for weak people and we should take care of them, right? Do you suppose that nature, just left, left to the mother nature, that we have a concern for the needy who can't help themselves, right? Because what I heard my whole life at school was that only the strong survive, right? Do you think the narrative of the hero unjustly dying for others, that that has just always been admirable, that that's just always how society's progressed? A lot of secular historians, I'd encourage you to check out one named Tom Holland, that they would say that these are ethics, these are virtues, these are ways of life that whether you believe in him or not came from Jesus of Nazareth, his life and his teachings. And so today what we're doing is we want to kick off a series that's going to take us all the way up through summer. As a church, we want, we want to teach, we want to meditate on, we want to saturate ourselves with the quintessential teachings of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, the discourse on the hill, the talk on the top, that this conversation, this, this sermon that Jesus gives, it's his, it's his fifth symphony. It's his, it's his Joshua Tree album. It is his Big Mac. It is his best work, right? And so today, what I simply want to do for our time together is I want to frame up what the sermon is, and then we're going to look at the first track on the album. We're going to look at how he starts this thing, all right? And in, if you're not familiar with it, in Matthew 5 through 7, in the Gospel of Matthew 5 through 7, we also see this in Luke, and we see it many other places, but it's collected in one piece in the book of Matthew. And we see the most comprehensive and core teaching of Jesus. And in this, he gives us pictures, uh, pictures of, of what his people are to be like. He says things like salt and light, like a city on a hill. He's like, this is what my people are to be like. And in it, <clears throat> he, gives, he gives intense instructions at times about how we are to respond to sin in our own lives. How to live when others offend us, hurt us, how we are to treat those in need. Like he talks about these things. He talks about things like hate and adultery, prayer, anxiety, money. He talks about the things that capture our hearts, that shape our habits, and not just the things we do, but the motivations underneath why we do them. Jesus in this, in this sermon, he's getting from a surface level to our hearts. He doesn't just want us to do the right things. He wants us to be people who out of the spring of our life comes a right way of living. He challenges us to be introspective, to be humble, to be cautious about this way of life and about how it is not easy. This Sermon on the Mount, this, this, this talk that Jesus gives, it's not just a collection of ideas. It's not a montage, but it was communicated as a whole piece 
And the order matters. We see this conversation build in these different sections. The way he taught it matters, right? They didn't have Google. They couldn't just open up their Bibles and pull this up. The way in which he taught these people 2,000 years ago, it, it flowed and it was memorable and it was punchy and it was illustrative, this teaching of life to the full. Now, Jesus, Jesus was an artist. He was, he was a, a beautiful, talented, skillful teacher. As we saw, he taught as one with authority. And, and it's interesting. One of the things about artists, you know, is we, we pull from our different references, right? Every, every, every artist, every communicator, every creator, there's influences that, that come from the way that we teach. And, and Jesus is no different. As we look at the Sermon on the Mount, there's these different threads. Uh, one theologian, Jonathan Pennington, that kind of paints this picture. There's these distinct threads that come into Jesus' teaching, right? The first is the, the grace of God. That Jesus, as he's teaching this sermon, it's almost as he's teaching his disciples with a crowd on looking, right? So almost, it's almost as he's teaching these disciples on behalf of everybody else. And now his disciples are people that he found, he called, he invited that he's patient and gracious with, that the conversation is all on the backdrop of the grace of God. It's real easy to read this sermon and be like, this dude's got a big list of things. And he does. But it's all against the backdrop on the canvas of God graciously coming and inviting and teaching us this beautiful life. That one thread is the grace of God. We cannot miss this, right? Second thread is, is this Hebrew wisdom literature. <clears throat> that, that Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. He was a man with a cultural history, right? And his teaching style wasn't, wasn't unique to him. It wasn't like he was the first guy to ever teach this way. He was just the best who had an authority like no one else had ever seen. But Jesus taught in this way of the prophets who came before him, of men of wisdom who came before him, right? That, that Hebrew literature has so much to do with wisdom. We see, we see this wisdom literature in our, old, in our scriptures, right? The Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes. It's wisdom literature. But not just that. The scripture tells us that in wisdom, God created the earth. That there was this Jewish picture of, of shalom, of peace, of ultimate wholeness. And wisdom was so closely tied to this. And Jesus, Jesus comes as a teacher in the tradition of this ancient Hebrew wisdom literature. And so we see this thread play into his sermon. But Jesus is also a man with cultural awareness, right? That Jesus is teaching during the time of the Romans and the Greeks. And so much of, of Greek philosophy influences our culture today. But the Greeks were interested in entertainment, in the arts, in philosophy, in the good life. They wanted to be people who were happy, who had meaning, who had purpose. And we have those same questions. Is the way I'm living, is who I'm listening to, is it, is it making me happy? Because I don't want to be depressed anymore. Is it going to point me in the right way? Like what YouTubers, what authors, what columnists are going to steer me in a way that gives me a fulfilling and happy life? Because that's what I want, right? Jesus speaks to this human longing that we all experience in the kind of the cultural context. Jesus is teaching us what the good life looks like, what life into the full actually looks like, right? He's playing to these cultural norms. And the last thing, this last thread that we see is Jesus is teaching in light of Roman rule. That there was conflict, the Jews and the Romans, and these cultural powers were growing and and Jesus is teaching in light of control, in light of these questions of who is in control, whose way is right, who has authority to say how we live and exist. And Jesus pulls this thread because Jesus is a king. And he's saying, this is what it looks like to live in my kingdom, right? He's giving the constitution to his kingdom. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, there's grace, there's wisdom, there's a good life, but I'm a king. And this is what life looks like under my rule. It, it's, it's, it's not a heavy burden, but it, it's a yoke that he teaches to come and walk alongside of with him in his kingdom. Now, before, before we jump into this, it, it's worth asking the question, okay, so Jesus teaches, but like, what is it, right? Like, like, what genre is this? What is the purpose of this? Like, what is Jesus doing? Is he 
Be because we all know this, if we misunderstand the purpose of something, it can lead to frustration, right? Like if I'm trying to dig a hole with a hammer, if I'm trying to clean my driveway with like a hoe, like it's gonna create problems, right? Misunderstanding of purpose leads to frustration. And so what is it that Jesus is doing? Is he just giving us principles for morality for whoever is listening? And he's just giving us, this is what you should do? Is that what he's doing? In this Sermon on the Mount, there's so many quick and kind of pithy and, and quick things. Is he, is he kind of giving us these proverbs that we can kind of pick up and kind of apply when the situation is necessary? Is, is that what he's doing? Is, is Jesus teaching us the how-to of Christian life? Like, if you're a Christian, this is what you should do. Is, is that what he's doing? See, it's interesting. I think as we read the Sermon on the Mount, and I would encourage you this week, maybe over the course of the week, just do a read through Matthew 5 through 7. Maybe put it on an audio book. Maybe read a couple sections uh, each week just to kind of get a lay of the land as we jump through this. But some of you, you you'll read the Sermon on the Mount, and, and maybe one camp that we'll be in is we're like, we just got to do it. We just, just do what Jesus says, right? Just do what he says. Some of us see these, these as things God wants me to do. And so we either think it's easy. We're like, yeah, we'll do these things. And we're kind of fooling ourselves a little bit. Or others of us were like, all right, we're going to do what Jesus says. He says that, and as we start to try to buckle down and do what he says, we're going to come up defeated real quick. One uh, theologian from, from Britain in the last century, father of the faith, John Stott, he said this, when you hear someone glibly claim to live by the Sermon on the Mount, it's probably best to assume that they've never really read the sermon. Like if we're just, yeah, we should just, you know, do what Jesus said. You read through that and you start to see things about plucking out eyeballs, chopping off wrists, the narrow path, and you're like, this is harder than I thought. But there's another camp, right? This other camp, and sometimes this happens in, in church world where, no, 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 Jesus was giving an impossible standard. Jesus was teaching an impossible standard that no one could measure up to just to point out our sin <clears throat> so that we'd see our need for him. I do think that is in here, and we're going to look at that. But, but if that is the sole reason of why Jesus is teaching, if he is going on a diatribe for three chapters and his quintessential teaching boils down to you can't do this anyways, you need me. If that's all it is, like, it's kind of a weird concept record, right? Stott says this, he says, people in this camp conclude that the teaching in these chapters represents the unpractical idealism of a visionary and says it's a dream that could never come true. And so we can have the attitude of, you know, we, it's impossible to do, it's all grace, so this stuff doesn't really matter too much. It, it doesn't matter. I've heard people say that, you know, it's really not about what Jesus taught, it's about what he did. And that would be what we call throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's absolutely what Jesus taught, and it's absolutely what Jesus did, which leads us to this, this third way, that if we, if we stay here, we're only looking at the horizontal, and there becomes this tension, but we look at this third way, the vertical aspect, and we see how Jesus, the teacher and the Savior, impacts this. We see that Jesus, that he ultimately taught and fulfilled the Sermon on the Mount. The only way that we understand this sermon is to look back and, and see the one who fulfilled it perfectly, who lived perfectly, and be humbled and amazed by him. When we, when we see the Sermon on the Mount and we hold up the, the, the beautiful teacher of Jesus, but also the Savior of Jesus, that he lived this, that he died for us, that he made a way to have life and life abundant, apart from Jesus, this is impossible. We can't do this. But with Jesus, with his spirit at work within us, with him leading us and guiding us, forgiving us, showing us grace, that it looks completely different. Then Stott says this. He says the truth of how we are to read the sermon is that both of those extremes, camp one and two, are wrong. Jesus held up these standards as principles of kingdom living, but he also realized that much more than human effort was required to reach these standards. Jesus spoke the sermon to those who were already his disciples and citizens of God's kingdom and children in God's family. Without the transformation of the new birth, this sermon will lead us to either foolish optimism or hopeless despair. Then he says this, I love this. The Sermon on the Mount has a unique fascination. It presents the heart of the teaching of Jesus. It makes goodness attractive. 
It shames our shabby performances. It stirs dreams of a better world. It describes what human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God. So let's jump into the first track on this album. Jesus was born of a virgin, that he grew up, that he was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist, that the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness, just as God led his people into the wilderness. And for 40 days, he resisted the temptation of the evil one, where his people failed in the wilderness, that he succeeded. And he, 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 with, he, he stayed strong in light of these temptations of the evil one. And when he returned from this time in the desert, he came and began to preach. And he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he began to call disciples. He began healing folks. And as his disciples followed him, saw him heal folks, he climbs up this mountainside. And he sits down, and it's here where he began to preach the greatest message ever preached. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of things about you because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, many, many of you have probably heard this before. Maybe heard it in songs. Maybe you've heard it in cultural references. That this is, this is kind of famous that you might see it sewn on a pillow. And if we're honest, we're like, no, I've heard that. What's he talking about, right? Because blessed... Blessed is not language that we always use, right? We might hear someone say, oh, bless you, bless you, maybe if you sneeze. But it's not language that we often use. This word blessed, this, this word, it's hard to translate, right? It's, it's, it's this Greek word, makarios, right? Makarios is this word, and that's important because it, we translate it as kind of this happy is the one who, right? Or almost, it's almost this exclamation, like good for him who blank, right? Lucky you, how fortunate for you who blank is the way that it would say makarios right like we might say makarios blessed is the one who gets the chipotle right before the line gets real long behind them right you're like ah oh, lucky you how fortunate is the one who's at the front of the line how blessed is the one who hits all the green lights when they're running late lucky you how fortunate you know we might say that blessed is the dad who beats the time that the gps said it was going to get there on vacation right like, ah, how fortunate, lucky, like that is what this language is saying, right? There was a, a, an old Jewish teacher from the time, uh, it's written down, you can go look it up, Wisdom of Ben Sirach, or it's called the Sirach. And, and you'll kind of see the, the flavors of, of the same Jesus was teaching in this Hebrew Jewish style, or in this ancient wisdom literature style. Ben Sirach does the same. Listen, listen to his blessings though. Listen to these blessings and see if they sound different from Jesus. He said, blessed, blessed is the one who rejoices in his children. You can hear kind of flavors of the Proverbs in that. He said, blessed is the one who lives to see the downfall of his enemies. He said, ah, if you get to see the downfall of your enemies, lucky you. Blessed is the man who lives with a reasonable wife, he said. He said, blessed is the one who doesn't sin with his tongue. All right, we hear flavors of the Proverbs in there. He said, blessed is the one who never has to serve an inferior. If you never have to serve someone lower than you, ha, lucky you. He said, blessed is the one who speaks and people listen. He's like, ah, if people pay attention to you, you are blessed. And you can hear how if that was kind of some of the, the expected cultural wisdom of the time, you can see how Jesus coming on the scene and saying, blessed are you who pour in spirit. Ah, if you're broken, if you hunger and thirst, lucky you. Are you mourning? Are you heartbroken? Are you defeated? Lucky you. And it's not what the people expected. I'm gonna look at just three things quickly, 
quickly. I want, I, we're not gonna pick through every single one of these, what are famously called the Beatitudes, but I want us to set the tenor that this first track on the album isn't what people expected. The first thing that Jesus begins with, he, he begins with an announcement, a blessed desperation. Look at these, these first four. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst, the desperate. Begins with this blessed desperation. These first four, uh, one, one uh, commentator, Frederick Dale Bruner, he describes these as almost these passive blessings, right? Like these people are doing nothing but being poor and sad and meek and hungry, right? And they're these, these passive blessings. But what Jesus is saying here, he is not saying, if you want to be blessed, then you have to be sad and weak and poor. It's, <clears throat> it's not an if-then situation, right? Because then it's, it's just go get sad and be sad about something. We all be blessed. We're all sad about something. He, he's, not, he's not giving a qualification. He's not saying, if you are this, then what he's doing is he's making a declaration. These people that would have followed him up on the mountainside would have been the poor, would have been the, those struggling with disablement, would have been people that were defeated, would have been kind of the, the middle, lower class of society who were looking for something, were the ones who followed him up, were listening to him. That's who his disciples were. And he, he's not saying, now if you can all start being sad and being broken, then what he's saying is in the state that you're in, you're mourning, you're poor in spirit, you are hungering and thirsting, that you are, you're meek, you're not the one that people are looking at, it's your lucky day. How lucky are you, right? Heard one friend uh, call it G-O-D, the gift of desperation. Because it's in this desperation that we begin to see God. Uh, I don't think I can say it better than Pastor John Ortberg. He said, these blesseds, these beatitudes, it's what these are called, are not things we have to do to earn our way into God's kingdom. They are the announcement that the good life is available to anyone, including the people who thought they were way outside of it. Do we not have this mentality, right? Like we, in our, in our weakest state, in our brokenness, in our failure, in our sin, and we're like, ah, I if I could get past then I could, if I could just get my life together, if I could just get a job, if I could just get a relationship, if I could just, and what Jesus is saying is lucky you because in the state that you're in is when you can most clearly see me. It's your lucky day. Makarios, blessed are you. And that, that may be you today. You may be anxious, wrestling with anxiety. You may be just d depressed. And if you're honest, you're like, I just have not been feeling where I should feel. You may be someone who just feels like you're at the end of your rope, out of options. That you may feel like you're, you're walking into church, walking onto the internet, just failing again, dropping the ball again, relapsing again. You may be watching this and you're like, I don't even know the first thing about the Bible. You may be overwhelmed. You may be wrestling with God and with doubt and with your faith. And what Jesus would say as he looks out, he says, your lucky day. Because it's in that weakness that we can most clearly see our need. It's in that humility, in that, that state, that Jesus' kingdom is going to start to make the most sense. And it can be easy as we go through the Sermon on the Mount and be like, man, it feels like you got to be like a rabbi or a priest or something to do all this stuff. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. You who's poor in spirit, you who's meek, you who's broken, this is for you. That's what Jesus is saying. He begins with this, this, this gift of desperation. He begins with this announcement. But look at these, these next three Beatitudes. That as he's, as he's given this first track in his album, he begins with this invitation, but he begins with a, an invitation for participation. The, these humble participants. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If those first four are, are kind of the active beatitudes, these next ones are, or those are passive, these next ones are kind of active beatitudes, active blessings. And it's not so much about suffering, it is about serving. Look at these three. Jesus invites those who are broken. He invites the, the poor in spirit. He invites those, those who are broken to participate alongside, to come and minister to other broken people. 
He's saying, you have inner turmoil, come and be someone who offers peace. You have spiritual brokenness, show mercy to those who are also broken. We looked at this a couple weeks ago, but he's saying, y- you, you are blessed in order to be a blessing. It's the way of the kingdom. He begins with this, this invitation to participate alongside of him, right? And look at this, this last section he says here. That Jesus, he's very realistic about how this plays out. He begins with the reality of the situation, almost a, a blessed persecution, right? He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil about you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This life, this way of citizenship with Jesus, it, it doesn't necessarily win friends and influence people. When Jesus was giving his last, he's sitting down at dinner with his disciples the last time before he would go to the cross. He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's like this promise, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But he says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. That Jesus acknowledges that this, this is hard. That this way of living, it's not easy. It's not flippant. But it's, it's so backwards from the path of our world that it may grit against many aspects of many cultures throughout history. And in our attempts to serve, in our attempts to help, that there will be persecution. We'll be misunderstood. be misinterpreted. That things won't always add up. It'll look like we're dropping the ball. I don't make a caution against this, though, because we know that it's easy for us, it's easy for people around us to kind of create this martyr complex, right? Like Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted, but sometimes we suffer and sometimes people talk bad on us and sometimes we're persecuted. Jesus Jesus says, when you're persecuted because of me. But if we're honest, many times we're persecuted not because of Jesus, but because of us. Because we, we don't know when to stop. Because in, in, in our opinions and in our doing it for Jesus, really we're trying to justify something inside of us. We're trying to handle the situation ourselves. We say it's Jesus, but there's an insecurity. There's an anger that, that comes out shrouded in Jesus' language, but really it's our insecurity. And, and sometimes we're persecuted because of that. It's, it's not because of Jesus. It's, it's because of our own insecurity. Because in this, there's an inherent humility that comes along with all that Jesus is teaching. There's a humility that's baked in and he cautions us throughout his sermon to look inward, to inspect our hearts, to look at our motivations, to see if what we're doing, to get, is it to get attention, to get sympathy, to get eyes on us? Or is it truly for the glory of Jesus? See, uh, Frederick Dale Bruner in these, these three postures, these, these first four beatitudes of the, the announcement this blessed desperation of these next three of this participation and these these last two of this of this persecution. He almost has these three postures. These first four are almost as this 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 posture of need. I'm broken in spirit. I'm mourning. I'm hungry and thirsting. I'm meek. You almost see this this posture of need, right? Stretched out to Jesus. And in these second three, there's almost this posture of giving. I want to be a peacemaker. I, I want to be merciful, right? I want to hunger and th- that there's almost this, this giving, right? This giving away. And this last, these last two, Bruner says, are almost these pictures of, of, of brokenness because of persecution. Almost like we're on our back with our arms out. That we've been misunderstood. We've been mislabeled. That in our attempts to follow Jesus, people didn't in- interpret it right. And now we look like we're on the outside. And he calls this the aerobics of discipleship. Because we are in constant need of Jesus. And we are constantly invited to partner with Jesus in the good work that he is doing. And we constantly find ourselves in a struggle which lead us back to a need for him. So as we jump into the Sermon on the Mount for the next handful of weeks, I would challenge you to read, to read through it just to get a lay of the land as we, as we break this down. And I I would first and foremost ask you this. Do you feel like you're out? Like you know in your mind, you know in your mind that like grace is for everybody and on paper you would say God's God's grace covers my sin and you know that. 
But do you always feel like the reality of Jesus is five steps ahead of you and you just can't catch up? You can't make sense of scripture all the time. You can't bring what Jesus said and your reality together. Your prayers feel like you're falling asleep or talking to the wall and you just feel like you're like, I don't, do you feel like you're out? Do you feel like there's something you have to get through first? Like if I could just get through this season, if I could just get a job first, if I could just, oh man, if I could just find a wife, if I could just find a husband first, then then we'll embark on this journey to get like, do you feel like there's something else like you, you, you relapse here? Like once I buckle down and get my life together, then I'm really gonna get into this Jesus stuff. Because Jesus would say, ah, no, no, no. Now, in, in your searching, in your brokenness, in your frustration, he'd say, lucky you. Because you are closer to the kingdom than you realize. Jesus isn't setting a hard, hard high bar. He's opening the door, saying, come on in. Because if the gospel is about anything, it's about Jesus meeting us in our brokenness and sin. Not us having to figure out how to get to him. And, and this, the entrance to this, to this kingdom message is no different. That he's saying right now, don't wait till you get that answer. Don't wait till you get all the pieces lined up. Walk to him in your need and frustration and brokenness and desperation and doubt. That, that's, that's who he's saying is blessed. I heard an author say this this week, and this has been challenging me. I want to ask you this. Jesus is this artist. Jesus is this, 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 this sage, this communicator, this rabbi, this teacher that people are following. That he is ticking off the right people. He's inviting other people. He's creating some, some ruffled feathers. He's amazing people. He's changing lives. Do you think Jesus is smart? We, you may say Jesus is humble. Oh, he was a humble carpenter from the Middle East. And he was. You may be like, I mean, he's God. He kind of like know everything. Like he, he, he was. But do you believe that this way of life that Jesus is going to lay out, this way that he's going to teach, do, do you believe that he's right in what he says? Because we listen to a lot of people. We read a lot of books. We hear a lot of voices. And, and some of that, there's good stuff, right? And then we hear some of the things Jesus says. And we're like, like go read the Sermon on the Mount this week. And you're like, I don't think he's right about that. Love your enemies? Yeah, but not in this situation. Go an extra mile with someone who's got pressing me? Like, well, he doesn't understand this situation. Like, he says some pretty hard things about divorce. He says some pretty frank things about lust and adultery. Like, he says some pretty hard things about hate. Like, he, he says a lot of, a lot of things. And he talks about fasting. He talks about how it looks when we pray. And we're like, yeah, but Jesus, maybe that... Do you believe that Jesus is smart? Because it's very easy for us to be like, oh, spiritual life. Yes, we should do that. But this is my romance life. Like, this is my dating life. And that's, he doesn't understand that. No, I think Jesus has a lot of good things to say, especially about this. That, But I'm trying to run a business and Jesus doesn't know the first thing about that. Right? Like, oh, I think, I think these principles for loving my enemies is great. But, oh, this is foreign affairs. And that's, to, like, do you believe that Jesus is smart? Do you, do you believe that he knows what he's talking about? Do, do, you, do you believe that, that walking with Jesus in this kingdom, though we may be persecuted, though it may look foolish, that it is the beautiful right way to live? Like, do you believe Jesus was smart? And for, I want to ask you this. For some of you that may have grown up in church, you, you were going to read the Sermon on the Mount, and you, you have heard all of this before. You've heard things about prayer. You've heard things about the log in your own eye. You've heard about the two paths. You've heard about the wise and foolish builders. I would ask you this. Are you bored? Are you bored with your faith? Do you feel like you're going to open this and be like, I've, I've heard all this before. I know this. I've taught this. I've memorized this. I think we know that familiarity oftentimes can be most deadly. It can be most deadly in a marriage. It can be most deadly in a friendship. As we fall into ruts in our nine to fives, that familiarity can be deadly. And my prayer, if you're, if you're someone who is bored, my hope is that through this sermon, you might see the genius and artistry of Jesus in a new way, that you might see the beauty of Jesus in a new way, that his spirit may challenge you in a new way, not just on a surface level, 
but in the depths of your heart because that's what Jesus wants to do. He doesn't want to talk here. He wants to talk here. And he wants that to come from us. And so my prayer for you, if you feel bored, if you feel stuck, is that you might be challenged through this sermon. One of my, my spiritual grandfathers is, is a man named Eugene Peterson. He wrote the translation of the message called the Bible, which all he was simply doing is just a paraphrase. He was just putting it into common speech for his church, for his people. He was a small pastor, pastor of a small church. And in these Beatitudes, he says it this way, and I want to end with this. He says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel like you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. He says, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He is food and drink and the best meal that you've ever had. He says, you're blessed when you care. Because in that moment of being careful, full of care, you'll find yourself cared for. He said, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. He says, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. He said, you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. And that persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And so Jesus, I pray that as we kind of embark on this, this journey through this through your greatest teaching, Jesus, that you would challenge us. That you wouldn't just change our behaviors, Jesus, but you would change our hearts. That in light of your grace for us, in light of your sacrifice for us, in light of you coming to us, Jesus, that we might see this teaching as a way of life that you have graciously invited us into. Jesus, we acknowledge that we cannot live this life on our own. We can't buckle down. We can't figure it out. But Jesus, I pray that your spirit would empower our church to be people who see our sin differently, to be people who see our enemies differently, to be people who see people in our lives in need differently. I pray that, that we might see our habits differently, Jesus, that you would challenge us to live in a different way. Jesus, I pray that you would challenge us to see you differently. That we might see your genius, that we might see your invitation, that we might see the beauty of the way of life that you've called us to live. We're thankful that you're gracious with us. We're thankful that you love us, that you forgive us. And we are thankful that you truly, Jesus, meet us where we are at today. It's because of Christ we pray. Amen.